Hi, and welcome back to the Impact Lounge. And uh, this is uh, the show that Ro and I do. Uh, I was going to say regularly, this is only the second one, which unfortunately, there should have been more of these by now, but due to uh, circumstances out with our control, um, this is only the second one. And uh, we did ask last time for you guys to drop us a line as to uh, what we think you should call this show. But this is the one where we look back at Impact, not the current show, but ones, whether it's a story arc, whether it's a particular match, an incident of years gone by, whether it's Impact, TNA, GWF, whatever you wanted to call it. Um, yeah, so so this week we are going to be looking at a story arc. And um, I'm going to be doing most of the sto- talking on this one because, uh, Ro, uh, I, th- I think you tuned out for a little while while this storyline was going on. I know you've done a bit of catch up and those kind of things, but what jumps to your mind when I say aces and eights? Um, what jumps to my mind is, <laughs> I hate to use this, but, you know, because many have followed this path, but uh, NWO-like stable that in its cr- in its inception that, you know, was promising, but we've seen mistakes along the way, and then ultimately it kind of failed towards the end, or the downfall, I should say. Well, I- I'm going to kind of agree and disagree with you on that one. But first of all, I- I'm going to do give you the i suppose the view i would say that reading when you read about the you know online or or people just commenting on various things aces and eights i think is remembered horrifically by fans and they always use it as a low point of of how wrestling shouldn't be done and those kind of things however for me and this is most probably where all our listeners switch off and they never respect anything i say again but for me it was my favorite story arc that uh, impact or tna at the time have ever done uh i look back at it and think not what it was but almost what it could have been and how well a coherent story came out of such an absolute mess and i'll explain it more when we get into it but uh for me it was it, it, it was an opportunity missed but even though the did everything they can to sabotage themselves as they went along. Um, I still think it was compelling viewing. And, and for anyone who, who's never actually seen any of the stuff from back then, you really should go and check it out. So um, where did we start? Well, um, I suppose the beginning is usually the best place. And the thing that I think this is what drew me into TNA uh, for the second time round, actually, was that um, I remember, you know, reading the WWE events, whether it was SmackDown or whatever it was, and people were talking about, you should see what's happening over on Impact at the moment. So I think at the time they might have been either head to head or something like that. Um, but it was chaotic at the time when they first appeared. There was like mass brawls going on backstage where the Impact roster, were, you know, or TNA roster were getting involved with this mysterious biker gang. Now, I, did you remember any of this, Ro, or was this... Um, all kind of vaguely familiar or not at all i you know i remember bits and pieces i remember when it started off you had the three mask guys that uh, attacked sting while sting was cutting a promo because i think it had been announced that sting was inducted into the hall of fame the impact uh, teen eight hall of fame so and that that's where it had started and then I think, you know, after that, just bits and pieces where, you know, this guy was revealed. I think the first actually revealed member was Devon out of all people. <laughs> yeah, well, it, he was actually the first one who was revealed. But 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 you're quite right. It started off at, at Sting's uh, Hall of Fame ceremony. And uh, it was when Hulk Hogan was manager, uh, sorry, uh, general manager of, of TNA. But uh, effectively, it was creative decided, let's have a look at the television. What's popular at the moment? And they kept, they saw Sons of Anarchy was popular. So they thought, let's have a biker gang. And I can't remember a, a proper biker gang in wrestling. I know there might have been one or two guys who dressed that kind of way. But I can't remember a full-blown stable like this. So anyway, uh, the, the story behind it was there was this masked gang. And, and the thing was, it kept on seeming to get bigger and bigger each week. Uh, a bit like, as you said, the NWO, um, which um, had more members than non-members, I think, at one point. But uh, Aces and Eights were, were appearing. They were attacking the roster. Uh, and I think they injured Hulk Hogan, apparently uh, fracturing his pelvic bone or something like that. Um, and then also they, they had to go at uh, D'Angelo De Niro and uh, attacked him. And Jeff Hardy, uh, Bully Ray, all of these guys were being 
you know, targeted left, right and centre. No one knew who this was. Now, the reason why I enjoyed it so much was I just loved the speculation around who was actually, you know, behind the masks. And funnily enough, I remember doing a podcast. And when was this? Was it 2012? So it's like six years ago, doing a podcast and, and saying, I'm sure it's Johnny Impact or Johnny Mundo or Johnny Morrison or whatever his name was in uh, WWE at the time. I was convinced he was one of them because there was a guy with long, long hair. It looked like him. Um, and you came up with all these things, aces and eights. So aces. So that's AA. Oh, it's Austin Aries. It must be him. And then aces and eights. So what's the eighth letter of the alphabet? Oh, it's H. 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 Oh, it must be Hulk Hogan. So I had all these weird theories that, you know, who it was going to be. And of course, I was completely wrong. So anyway, the, the storyline unfolded and eventually they they got to the point where, you know, everyone was wondering, who is it? Who is it? Who is member of Aces and Eights? And this is when the term TNA, TNA, you know, TNA being TNA, uh, they revealed Devon as the first member of Aces and Eights. Now, I'm not being funny, but you've got to admit that is the most underwhelming person i think that you could ever reveal as a member of aces and eights uh, do you remember this at all yeah yeah um all, what i was gonna say was i think at the start of it they had a good idea on hand because during this time tna was real I and mean, i remember watching bits of, bits and pieces of it it was more when they went to the destination america days where i kind of missed out but back to this um, they're really staple heavy. I want to say around this time you had um, I don't know if th this had to be a uh, after Immortal, but you know Fortune. They had all these stables, so you know originally this was just you know another stable, but it looks like they had an idea, but then they started going on the fly, and I thought revealing Devon as you know the first revealed member, and nothing against Devon, but during during his time in TNA, he was always. You know, we knew him as, you know, as part of Team 3D, obviously. And then he, when he uh, broke apart, he was always a mid-card guy. So it was kind of underwhelming to have him. I thought had they had a bigger name be the first reveal, it would have been a bigger impact, so to speak. Yeah, absolutely. And, and do you know what? It, it was the, the, the thing that was the most disappointing at this point was that they'd done so well to build up intrigue as to who these guys were. And, and that, that was the genius part of it you know no one knew it, it was a surprise although we kind of knew who was behind you know we thought we knew as i said johnny impact was one of them i said um and i had all these these conspiracy theories no one actually knew and you know you had all these clubhouse things like lax are doing now where you had people in masks sitting around drinking beer don't know how you drink beer with a mask on but anyway they did um and you know people with voice boxes to disguise it it's just a shame they revealed it as devon now another thing about it, which i didn't mention was that they had an amazing entrance as well I, and for me i think one of the best entrance themes that tna have ever done uh, as a matter of interest do you, do you have a favorite entrance theme or um i always liked the uh, aj styles the i am that, that was my favorite yeah well but this one it was uh, a jangly kind of guitar music and just the way they introduced them it was always the same that they came walking in from a different part of the crowd and the camera swooped over the audience and and when you go back and watch this row and, and see some of the things you, you'll see what i mean how their entrance every time was unique and and, and i just thought brilliantly brilliantly presented and then they had Devon. And this is where it started to go wrong because it wasn't just Devon. It was every subsequent member after that. It was like, oh, Devon was bad. Oh, man, this is even worse. You know, and, um, you know, I I'm just trying to think who, who the next member was that we saw. Um, I think it might have been, was it Doc? Was he next or, or um, what's his name? Uh, Doc Gallows. Yeah. Uh, Luke Gallows. Yeah, yeah. Luke Gallows, yeah. I, I think, might have been the next one. Then they had Garrett Bischoff identified. Then you had um, D'Lo Brown. <laughs> I mean, these <laughs> Garrett Garrett Bischoff and Wes Briscoe was another one that was identified. You know, the roster was was just you know being used up with with guys who just weren't very good. Nux. And don't get me wrong, I like Nux. Luke Gallows, brilliant. You know, I, I think that he is so much more than what he is now when he was in Aces and Eights as Doc. You know, his, his tag team now, even when he was Festus back in WWE, 
horrible. He's horrible in the WWE. But as Doc, he was brilliant. And, um, you know, so although they were revealing some of them as terrible, like Garrett Bischoff, I think overall it was still quite interesting because I suppose, although looking back, the, these guys weren't brilliant wrestlers and they weren't big names and those kind of things. It really should have done more than they did with it. So anyway, um, storyline kind of meandered on more back and forth, injuring random people, all these kind of things. And uh, eventually Mr. Anderson got inducted in as well. Uh, they, they inducted him in as opposed to him being an original member. And uh, that's when it started to get interesting because he was kind of the guy that came in and was, I suppose, the, the, the cuckoo in the nest, the one who was ruffling up the feathers and those kind of things. Um, so we still didn't know who the uh, leader was. And it eventually came down to a steel cage match, I think, between, from memory, Bully Ray versus Jeff Hardy. And this is where the Aces and Eights got into the cage and they threw Bully Ray the hammer and he was revealed as the leader. Now, one thing I'll say about this is I hated the hammer as a weapon in a wrestling match. What, did you do you remember this or do you have any opinions on it? Or? Yeah, uh, no, I agree. Because just because if there's anything that... <laughs> you would call fake seeing a hammer it being used in a wrestling match i mean by far has to be one of the things i mean it probably rivals janice um that <laughs> you, because you think about it if you were to hit somebody really with it and i mean i guess you could argue the same thing with a chair but we know with a hammer or janice you really hit somebody with something like that I mean, that's it, you know, so to see someone get hit with a hammer in a wrestling ring is just kind of, you know, it kind of... It's <laughs> stupid. It's yeah. absolutely stupid because uh, a kid watching this at home can go and get a hammer from the, the from their dad's toolbox. They can't go and get a baseball bat with spikes in it, <laughs> you know. <laughs> so it, that, that's the reason why, for me, it, it, it was the most ludicrous thing anyway. So um, they, they kept on hitting people with hammers and then... Uh, Devon was revealed, uh, sorry not Devon, Bully Ray was revealed and this was the first part where the storyline for me actually got interesting, well not interesting but actually exploded and came back into being brilliant because what they did from this point on was they kind of rewound the whole 12 months of the storyline to kind of put Bully Ray as the leader they showed all the things that he did leading up to this point and for me this was one of the pinnacles of tna is that they put a video package together that was absolutely outstanding to show how it all kind of fitted together over a 12-month period including his marriage to brooke um all these kind of things and how, how he led them all on and it gave us the bully ray character now i'm gonna say well, i'm gonna ask you bro what do you think about bully ray as my interest I thought he did some of his best work in, once he became the Bully Ray character. You know, he. I think we see a lot of times with tag team wrestlers when they split. Obviously, there's always one who achieves great success, and then the other one kind of gets lost in the shuffle. And I think with him, they uh, TNA at the time really gave him an opportunity to, you know, become. Uh, main event guy and he capitalized on it and he he did well um i will say with this when you look at the whole aces and eights it took so long for them to reveal a leader and him be the leader after he had been feuding with them and having his own problems with him and i really feel like while the whole aces and eights the person who really got the biggest rub out of it was bully ray this is what really kind of a uh, doom doomed them and I'll, I'll give you my uh conclusion of what i think thought of it the whole uh group as a whole towards the end of this yeah sure well i, I was gonna say that i, I know what you're saying you know that if you do with them those guys, but i i did think they did a good job and and just going back to to bully ray i think that when he was bully ray in tna it was the best he's ever been in his career. And I think they were a good tag team. They were never particularly my favorite. You know, I preferred Edge and Christian and to some extent, even the Hardys more than them, but they were a good tag team. And I think they're the most decorated tag team as well from memory. I think they've won more tag titles than anyone else. Um, but anyway, uh, the point I was going to make is that as a person, 
uh, and I don't talk badly about wrestlers very often. And this is most probably going to get me kicked off this channel. But I think that that Bully Ray's a piece of shit. I really do. Mainly because whenever he goes to a, a new company, he bad mouths the previous company more than any other wrestler out there. Um, and, you know, but TNA, I'm not going to say they made Bully Ray. They certainly made him as a, a singles wrestler. They didn't make him as a tag wrestler, but they were the one who gave him the ball to, to run with. And they built virtually an 18-month program around this guy. And then as soon as he leaves, he talks trash about them. I, I honestly dislike the guy immensely. Um, and I, I just, I think he's tarnished his reputation with the way he behaves on a personal level. Anyway, uh, that's why I was asking you what you thought of him. I, I don't know if you agree with that at all. Um, you know, it's just a prime example and give credit to now the new regime. It seems like they're kind of steering away from that. But anytime you get guys from the former company and they come over, TNA has the tendency to push them to the moon. And you see the lack of appreciation that they have, you know, like, look, we, you know, we're just fans and, you know, we cover the product. I'm sure there's a lot of stuff that goes behind the scenes. And everyone has different experiences with the company, whether it be positive or negative. But you notice the ones who benefit the most tend to always badmouth the company on their way out. You would think it'd be more of the ones that were um, underutilized. But that that's the thing. You know, we've seen him go to the other company and be made to look as a joke or, you know, there was just a nostalgic uh, factor. And, you know, he was perfectly fine with that. So um look i'm not gonna take anything away i thought he did some of his great work you know but it is what it is i mean the company's in a better place now and you know i'm glad to have uh wrestlers on the roster now that show more appreciation yeah absolutely so back to aces and eight um up to this point they started off strong they dipped when they started revealing members then they got to bully ray and i thought that they were, they were back on track doing great stuff. And I thought the way they interweaved everything was great. Now, what happened next? They started adding in more members to this feud, namely Tito Ortiz and Rampage Jackson, which <laughs> was because of their deal with Bellator, just so that they could kind of co-promote a Bellator event, believe it or not, which in the end never happened because Bellator said they don't want them to be on TV. Um fighting on, on, on Impact or TNA uh, ahead of their match. So this was just a bust from, from the moment it was introduced. But anyway, th they were introduced. And then things started to go really badly. And um, people started to leave. Uh, I think Doc was the first one. He was just about to get a push. Then he decided he wanted to go to Japan. So that then fell to Mr. Anderson. Um, then uh, Brooke Hogan, uh, who was supposed to be engaged uh, and no, sorry, married to, to Bully Ray at this point, tweeted out a picture of her engagement ring on her official page, which kind of then spoiled that storyline as well. Uh, but fair play. And, and this is why I love this storyline. Creative found a way of turning Brooke Hogan, the person who was married to Bully Ray on screen, who tweeted about her real life romance and engagement to someone else. They turned it into a storyline by saying, to having Bully Ray talking to Brooke on the phone and saying, get your ass out of here and turning it into Brooke Tessmacher. Uh, so this is why I love the storyline is that no matter how badly things went, creative somehow managed to pull an ace out of the hole. Now, I know that's that's yeah, no pun intended there, but I think creative, how they ever got a storyline out of this this numerous things going wrong was was amazing. Uh, I don't know if you remember this at all. Yeah, I, I mean, like I said, it, it's all coming back to me. I, I think where I had got lost was, you know, when they started adding, I guess when you tell me who all got added, I think that was a thing where I needed refreshing. Because I, I remember some of the main guys who were part of the group. But that's what I feel kind of uh, doomed this stable was – it seemed like typical NWO where, you know, you got your three main guys. Well, in this case, it was three guys we didn't know. Okay. Then, they, I, I, I mean, I guess towards the end, because ultimately they broke up after Anderson defeated Bully Ray. I think, I think that was a stipulation that 
aces and eights had to disband. But we've seen where they had some mild rise where nobody's really getting a comeuppance on them. It was either you lose the aces and eights or you lose and then you join them. So they kept adding more and more people. And, you know, every week it was them getting, you know, uh, over on the TNA roster. And then eventually, you know, finally they just disband. And that's just kind of like with the NWO. It was great, you know, when it first started. And, you know, you of course you're going to add some members and whatnot. But then when you add everybody, nobody gets over. Everybody joins. It takes away from it. So I, I just, that was just my takeaway. It looked like they had a good idea on paper but they were trying to go too much of the nwo route i think had they and even i know you know when you think about a doc gallows and west briscoe garrick bischoff i know you know with the latter two you know those weren't notable guys to fans during that time but that would have been an opportunity to kind of for them to make a name for themselves but instead, you know, they resorted back to putting, you know, you put in Bully Ray, you put Devon, you put Anderson, um, D'Lo Brown to a lesser extent. You're putting these guys that fans are familiar with and it took away from everyone else. So, like I said, you know, it seemed to me the only one who benefited from the whole angle was Bully Ray once they uh, revealed that he was a leader. So, I mean... To say that it was the worst, I mean, you know, teach his own. I don't think it was the worst. I just think on paper, the idea seemed good, but they try to recreate something that, you know, was what they try to recreate the NWO. There's no no other way to put it. And I think we've seen in wrestling when you try to recreate certain things, sometimes you can only catch that lightning in the bottle that first go around. You know, you kind of have to be unique, you know, in a sense. Because when you try to recreate, just like with movies, you know, a lot of times the sequel doesn't even compare to the original. No, I, I think you're right. I, I think that the problem here was all about casting. And that was that was the major issue. I mean, this was like, you know, um, I'm, I'm trying to think of a blockbuster film at the moment. My mind's gone completely bad. But, you know, it's like, you know, having Harry Potter and, you know, and, and casting, I don't know, uh, Eric Estrada in the lead. You know, that... that, that that was a bit of a random uh, <laughs> casting. But anyway, um, the point being is that I think the storyline was sound. And, and and I disagree that it wasn't another. Well, it was an NWO in the respect that the members kept on coming in. But I think it was visually unique enough and the storyline was unique enough that it wasn't close. I, I think it was better presented. It's just a shame that the casting was so bad. Now, just, just finally, to, to, to finish off the story, the last thing, uh, you know, talking about the, the people who benefited from it, you're quite right, Bully Ray was the main one. You know, they he basically had 18 months worth of programming built around him. Uh, even though he wasn't in the main event for a lot of it, you know, when Austin Aries was champion, it was Bully Ray who was the main main attraction eventually. But, you know, Nux, no, not Nux, uh, Doc could have been a start, but he decided to leave. And the other one was, I think it reinvig, uh, well, revitalized uh, Mr. Anderson. I think that he did really his best work when he was in Impact or TNA. I, I think that was his best run uh, towards the end. But the final thing I just want to say about the whole storyline, and um, once again, it's greatly maligned was the funeral of Aces and Eights. Now, I can't remember if this was on Destination America when they did this or not, but, Ro, if you haven't seen this, go and Google it, because I, I think it was one of the last great things that TNA did as a... Well, I know they did the final deletion and all that jazz last year, but it was of that era, with that kind of roster, it was the last great thing that they did. It was brilliant. And there was so many jokes in it and the things, and it was completely off kilter. It didn't fit in with the story. <laughs> at all but if you any of our listeners if you haven't seen it go and google uh or youtube aces and eights funeral because it, it is very very good and very funny but anyway that's all i got to say about it um for me it wasn't an nwo rerun for me it was something that was unique uh greatly maligned by by the iwc and something which i think uh hopefully one day we'll get the recognition it deserved because I think the MVP in all of this uh, was the creative team who managed to get an 18-month storyline out, a terrible cast and just terrible misfortune. So there you go, listeners. Let us know what you think. Was it as bad as everyone else says or do you agree with me and think that it was one of the last great things that, that TNA, well, that TNA did, not Impact, that TNA did? All right, Ro, anything to add before we go? No, I think you covered everything quite well.
All right, listeners, make sure to hit subscribe. Check out the weekly impact reviews that Ro and I do. And uh, uh, as we said last time, if you've got a name for this segment, let us know and we'll be happy to to, to uh, baptize Chris at this, this show going forward. All right, everyone take care.